When we think of sunken cities, most of us think of Atlantis. According to the Greek philosopher Plato, it was a city of immense wealth, being rich in natural minerals and lush vegetation. Atlanteans were said to have built fantastic temples, displayed beautiful architecture, and created magnificent statues to the gods. Having once been a privileged and favored people, the Atlanteans became corrupt and degraded, according to Plato, by interbreeding with mortals and diluting their noble seed which allegedly descended from the gods. So Zeus gave Atlantis to Poseidon and it was swallowed up by the sea. Plato said he learned of this myth from Solon, a very respected Athenian statesman who in turn was told about the Atlantean Empire from the ancient Egyptians who had retained its memory etched in stone in their temples. Unfortunately, Plato died before completing his descriptions of Atlantis, leaving much of the story unfinished and so many details remain a mystery. According to Plutarch, a priest at the Temple of Apollo, quote, Plato, ambitious to elaborate and adorn the subject of the lost Atlantis as if it were the soil of a fair estate unoccupied but appropriately his by virtue of some kinship with Solon, began the work by laying out great porches, enclosures, and courtyards such as no story, tale, or posy ever had before. But he was late in beginning and ended his life before his work. Therefore, the greater our delight in what he actually wrote, the greater is our distress in view of what he left undone. For as the Olympium in the city of Athens, so the tale of the lost Atlantis in the wisdom of Plato is the only one among many beautiful works to remain unfinished. Atlantis was said to be ruled by a confederation of kings, and its power extended over Libya as far as Egypt and over Europe as far as Tuscany. About 8,000 years before the Trojan War, Atlantis attempted to conquer the whole of the Mediterranean world, but was defeated by the Athenians and their allies. Of course, by the time of the Great War of the Gods, after which Atlantis met its demise, it was already a morally degraded society, which had already undergone generations of multiculturalism which weakened their society, ethics, morals, and many of its inhabitants became materialistic, greedy, and a spiritually ugly civilization. According to Plato, quote, For many generations, as long as the divine nature lasted in them, they were obedient to the laws and well affectioned towards the God whose seed they were, for they possessed true and in every way great spirits. However, the Atlanteans became corrupt. When the divine portion began to fade away and became diluted too often and too much with the mortal admixture and the human nature got the upper hand, they then, being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly and to him who had an eye to see grew visibly debased. So, what did Plato mean by mortal admixture when he said that the Atlanteans' divine portion began to fade away and became too diluted too often by the mortal admixture? While this passage has been the topic of much speculation and debate for centuries, it is only recently that modern science has unlocked the secrets of the human genome not only sequencing the DNA 
of human races across the globe, but also sequencing the genetics of the various pre-human hominins, such as Neanderthal, Denisovans, Homo erectus, and other upright walking hominins, which in an anthropological context are not considered modern human. In biology, taxonomy is the science of naming, defining, and classifying groups of biological organisms on the basis of shared characteristics. And despite what many people think, it is not quite set in stone. In other words, it's constantly changing as new discoveries are made and there's an ongoing debate as to how a species is defined. As in many cases, different organisms which have clearly different attributes, such as having a different number of chromosomes, can still produce viable offspring, yet by most standards cannot be considered the same species. An example I often give is the distinction between lions and tigers, which have a lot, while male lions are even thought to be lazy in a way. Lions generally like to live in large groups called prides, where one male is usually in charge, and it's the female lion who hunts for food, bringing prey back to the pride, as the male lions rely on females for their meals. On the other hand, tigers prefer to live and hunt on their own. Tigers hunt for their own prey in the jungle and then eat their catch alone. Therefore, one can say that lions are definitely more sociable than tigers. Yet despite these behavioral and physical differences due to having different genetics, lions and tigers can produce viable hybrid offspring together called ligers. Traditionally, it was believed that ligers are sterile, but recently a liger in a zoo in Munich, Germany gave birth. The father was a lion and the mother was a liger, so gene flow and hybridization can and does happen, and it has happened between different hominin species in humanity's past. On May 16th, three female Liliger cubs were born at the Novosibirsk Zoo. This is the second time Zeta has given birth. Last fall, the young Ligris gave birth to a female cub na named Kiara. That said, like lions and tigers, the various upright walking hominins are not all the same. They did not have the same IQ, which is an attribute of genetics and they did not behave the same either. While some hominins such as Cro-Magnon developed agricultural communities, which is attested to by their prominent chin and lack of prognathism, an agricultural trait, meaning how far the mouth sticks out from the face, other hominins such as Homo erectus have never displayed any agricultural civilization for millions of years always living as hunter-gatherers in small packs without any advanced tools such as bow and arrows or bifacial tool technology used in spears. Cro-Magnon lived in larger agricultural communities, domesticated animals such as horses and cattle, had a much larger cranial capacity, and produced fine art while living together in strong communities. Homo erectus did not behave the same way, did not produce the same tools, was not seafaring, did not produce architecture, did not produce pyramids, did not domesticate animals, ride horses, chariots, have a wheel, or travel the world. Modern humanity, to various degrees, are a combination of these various traits and genetics. And for this reason, different demographics behave differently, the same way that tigers, lions, and ligers all behave differently. Some of these cats like water, some do not like water, and likewise, we can see variation in human behavior, variation in human intelligence, variation in athletic performance, and community or social skills. 
In this context, one can better understand what Plato might have been alluding to when he spoke of admixture of the Atlanteans, which altered their civilization and degraded it into something more violent and, in his words, visibly debased. Of course, this genetic hybridization is mirrored in the passages of the Bible, such as Genesis, and similar works, such as the book of Enoch, where it says that, quote, And it came to pass, when the sons of men had increased, that in those days they were born to them fair and beautiful daughters, and the angels, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the children of men, and let us beget for ourselves children. In modern times, many people have equated these ancient myths and biblical stories to scenarios that one might hear in the UFO community, where interactions between people from space and people on Earth also result in hybrid offspring. One example of this theory was put forth in 1958 by alleged UFO contactee George Van Tassel, who worked for Douglas Aircraft, Hughes Aircraft, and Lockheed. The story of the spaceships and the people who operate them is not anything new. Some of the people in this country and around the world are trying to open their minds to the point where they could accept possibly that somebody somewhere on another planet is intelligent enough to fly here and uh, observe us super beings. This isn't actually the case at all. These people originally colonized this planet. Their ancestors and ours are the same people way back in history. The people in these craft coming here are the same people that our Bible is written about. They're called angels to us by the church simply because we don't understand what angels are. Now the story of Adam, which has been misunderstood, Darwin tried to tie us up with the apes and couldn't find the missing link. Adam was a colony landed on this planet by the ancestors of these people coming here today. That's where we got the name Adam in the Bible because these people are of the tribe of Adam. The Adamic people landed here, and very much as we would do on a planet that was practically uninhabitable, if we landed on a strange planet, we would send a crew of men up there to kind of knock off the rough corners before we took our women along. And that's exactly what they did. And it tells you that in the Bible, too. It tells you they were lonesome. They had no help me. It says they in the plural, too. It doesn't say he. And Adam is referred to as them in the plural many times. These, the true race of man, that's what they are. We are, we are humans and they are man. There's a difference. Man was given dominion all, over all things, not humans. The true race of man in the colonization of this planet found here an upright, beautiful creature. The Bible says these creatures were upright and beautiful. That's the thing that Darwin tried to tie us together with when he tried to have us evolve from an ape. It never happened that way. The missing link that Darwin couldn't find was breeding. It was during the course of the time the Adamic man was on this planet that he didn't have his helpmate, that he found he could mate with these upright animals. And the crossbreed descendants of that original sin, or crossing of species, is the human race. We today are descendants of that original sin. We're not responsible for it, but that's what it was. That has never been properly explained. These people's explanation of it is the 
the best to my knowledge that I've ever heard. Now it stands to reason that if Eve, which they say was a race of these upright creatures, both male and female, there weren't just the women, there were men and women of this upright creature, but they weren't of the race of man. These people explained it in that way. They said the race of Eve were these upright creatures, and the race of Adamic man were the colony they landed here. Now, you can understand the misunderstanding of religion today simply because the interpretation of religion hasn't been authentic. The people who have interpreted it and administered have not understood it themselves. Now, further on, this went on all through the Bible, different people landing, messengers, Lot talked to them. Many cases it tells you about these people came, these angels came, and they entertained them overnight, took them into their house. They especially washed their feet, which seemed to be a, a symbol of honor among people then. Now, you don't wash the feet of spooks. They got to be people. That's all there is to them. You can't wash the feet of a spirit or a, a spook or ectoplasm or protoplasm or any other kind of plasma. The feet they washed were people's feet, just like us. And it tells you this further in the Bible, that these angels are people. Because it tells you not to lock your doors at night. You may entertain angels unawares. Now, an angel must look like us if we would entertain someone unawares. Certainly, if an angel looked any different than our people here, we would know the difference. We wouldn't un entertain them unaware. All through the records of the Old Testament and the New Testament is given this evidence that these were people. Now, you can understand back in those days when the Bible was written, when the average person didn't even own a donkey, and a chariot was the highest form of mechanized transportation they had. And the royalty rode on a white horse that if people came out of the sky and got out of a ship and walked among them and looked like them, that the only way they could separate those people from the people who lived on the ground was to designate them symbolically in some way, which they did. They are around this planet in great numbers. They have always been here. They've always had ships around the planet observing things. Naturally, you can see why they didn't want to mix with us, because this is a sick planet. We are the descendants of a mistake their forefathers made in violation of the law. Therefore, they look upon us as their responsibility. And that's primarily why they're around the planet. They know we are the only planet occupied in this solar system that are not capable of taking care of ourselves in this crisis that's coming. Whether there's any truth to this interpretation of the fallen angels is still speculation. But what is no longer speculation is that humanity is a hybrid species, which has been established by genetic research and should be obvious by the facts that there are still anomalies that occur during the hybridization process. The most obvious example being when the body of an RH negative mother tries to reject her own baby if it's RH positive as an allergic reaction, recognizing it as foreign to herself which in modern times is easily taken care of through the use of a shot, but still speaks to the reality that this incompatibility is a result of hybridization and that we are descended from different hominin species, such as Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Denisovan, Homo erectus, that all interbred in ancient times in what some recent articles refer to 
as a Lord of the Rings world, where ancient cultures interacted with each other, some advanced, some primitive, some agricultural, some hunter-gatherer, and the idea that humanity is the result of a smooth, linear evolution from a single source is proven false, as certain populations have DNA exclusive to themselves, such as West Africans, which have archaic genetic contributions from what scientists call a ghost species, which some geneticists believe is probably related to Homo erectus, which is not found in the DNA of Asians and Caucasians. We call it a ghost population because this is not a population which we have identified based on any fossil evidence. And what we find is this model, which has a ghost introgressing into the African population, does explain this conditional site frequency spectrum. We also looked at other models, other models of introgression. Maybe this is not really a ghost. Maybe it's, it's the Neanderthals coming back together and mixing. Turns out, again, we can reject this. It doesn't fit our data. And we can reject this model at a fairly stringent p-value. And one of the interesting aspects of this is this was a population that split off prior to Neanderthals splitting off from modern humans. So it's a fairly old population. And almost 11% of the ancestry of Africans comes from this ghost archaic population. So compared to the 2% or the 3% attributable to Neanderthals and Denisovans. So this had a fairly big impact in terms of how much ancestry comes from this population. Which is not found in the DNA of Asians and Caucasians, which makes the ancient myths, legends, and biblical stories sound more plausible regardless of whether UFOs were involved or not. And the obsolete theories, such as the out of Africa hypothesis, sounds more and more like a politically motivated fairy tale. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts. So please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon.